Thank you, Sheridan. So again, my name is Nick Valeski. Um, I kind of wear two hats at the moment. Right now, I'm a graduate student here at USU studying high value crops in Utah, pursuing a master's degree in plant science. And then of course, I work for our USU Extension Integrated Pest Management Program. So a lot of my experience from these past few years involves commercial vegetable production, plant pathology, entomology, pesticide application, and of course, general integrated pest management. So I kind of just want to give an overview of growth of small scale agriculture in Utah. The rapid development in Utah these past few years has caused this interest shift from large scale farming to small urban farming. Utah has sadly lost about 16,792 acres of farmland between 2012 and 2017. However, the total farm operations has increased where 34% of these farms are between one and nine acres. And 44% of these are run by individuals who are relatively new to farming. So this might be a category that you guys fall in. I also want to highlight some evidence showing that Utah small farmers have an interest and desire to learn about pest management. In 2020, my supervisor and I designed a survey in which we had 3,250 individuals respond. 45% of those people indicated that they have an interest in general integrated pest management techniques. 54% wanted to learn more about specific insect identification and their management. 73% said they like to better understand natural enemies and ways of promoting them. So similarly, within the USU Extension Manage Utah Gardening Experts Facebook group, um, which has about 19,000 members, I've always identified reoccurring questions and comments from clientele relating to non-chemical options to manage arthropod and plant diseases. So from all of this, I think there's strong evidence that Utahns have an interest in sustainable pest management. So either by choice or necessity, many small scale farmers are highly motivated to minimize their use of pesticides. Um, the reasons can include a preference for or commitment to organic farming methods, um, or it could be like a lack of access to suitable pesticides and appropriate pack sizes and or possible restrictions of pesticide use in urban areas. So let's get down to it. With my role in USU Extension, I teach farmers and home gardeners about integrated pest management. Integrated pest management or IPM is a comprehensive approach to pest control that uses a combined means to reduce the status of a pest to tolerable levels while maintaining a quality environment. So there's a lot of different models indicating different thresholds and control actions um, for different pests, but ultimately it's up to you, the farmer, to decide what level of pest damage is acceptable for your farm. So consider your farm size, the labor, the cost of pest control versus the potential profit. And we'll talk about all these things as I go through the presentation. But within the world of IPM, we use this pyramid model. Um, it covers all the different ways that we can manage pests, and they usually fall into one of these four categories. So at the bottom of the pyramid, we have cultural practices. So these are um, methods that are applied over a long period of time aimed at reducing and avoiding pest problems. The next level is mechanical control. So the, this is like physical things we can do, like physically removing a pest, trapping or excluding pests using different techniques. And then of course, biological control, which uses um, one species to reduce the adverse effect of another. So this can be like a parasitite predator or pathogen. And then lastly, kind of the smallest and top portion of our pyramid, so these are the last things we want to do, is chemical controls, which we would use sparingly and only if we determine it necessary. 
And this can include both organic and synthetic pesticide options. So the economic injury level, this is an important concept. This is the lowest population density of a pest that will cause economic damage or the amount of a pest injury, which will justify the cost of control. And then over here, the action threshold is the pest density at which control measure should be implemented to prevent it from reaching that economic injury level, the point where the economic loss occurs. So like I just mentioned, on a national level, there are some thresholds for various pests and diseases that have been calculated for small acreage farmers. In Utah, we have, model, we have a few modeled for home orchards, but for vegetables, it's really fluid. So I think, it, again, it's dependent on several factors. Um, it's up to you, the small urban farmer, to decide the threshold for your own operation. And then we have this equation here um, this is just a simplified version, but you can see it's easy to see how considering costs, values, and losses can assist the pest manager in determining when the pest is actually causing economic loss. So now we're going to talk about several things that we can do on our farm. So weeds themselves are considered a pest um, as they can compete with our farm crops for light, nutrients, and water. Um, prevention, eradication, and control are three general strategies we use to manage them. And USU Extension actually has a lot of specialists and tons of guides, videos, and other resources on weed identification and management. So it's a whole separate rabbit hole that you can go down. Um, but I want to emphasize this. Um, various weed species growing on our farms can serve as an alternate host for different arthropods and pathogens. So, for example, the red pigweed, so thistle, prickly lettuce, um, and purslane can all host tomato spotted wool virus and their vector thrips. So, a few ways we can manage weeds. Um, one is a wheel hoe. This is a tool designed to quickly weed between the rows with minimal effort. And these can be filled with various attachments that furrow, cultivate, or hoe soil and weed. And these usually run between $100 and $250. Um, and then I personally always use plastic mulches of various colors, which are great not only for weed suppression, but temperature management and soil moisture retention. These are best applied um, using a small tractor attachment. And studies have found that silver or reflective plastic mulches um, are effective in deterring various insect pests as well. So again, pricing depends on the color, the amount you buy, but I found for 4,000 feet, um, a roll of the standard black plastic that's about three feet wide, that can range from 125 to $200. And then, of course, you guys might be familiar with using straw or hay. If you spread that pretty thick, like four to six inches, um, this can be a good option for excellent weed control within vegetable crops. You just want to make sure that you ensure the hay or straw is not contaminated with weed seeds. Um, so to manage weeds chemically, you can use herbicide options, and these can be incorporated prior to planting. Um, applied at pre-emergence, post-transplant, or post-emergent. And then the pricing of herbicides is really variable too. Okay, so most edible plants grown in our home garden can have serious disease or pest issues that can overwinter. So therefore, kind of cleaning up our site at the end of the season is really important. Um, it's important. It's good to remove all the leaves, stem, fruits, and other plant parts after the first frost. Removing diseased plant debris reduces the risk in the following growing season. And then plant debris removal also eliminates an overwintering site for a lot of insects, which can help reduce the insect population the upcoming year. And fall is a good time to also add amendments like um, well-rotted manure, leaves, compost, and of course, disease-free garden waste. And these amendments add organic matter and benefit the soil micro microorganisms 
and overall good soil health, which of course helps keep our plants healthy from pests. And then of course, um, additionally, tilling can disrupt the overwintering life stage of various pests. So that might be in the soil or ground residue. So that could be the egg stage, the larva stage, pupa, or the adult stage. So we were kind of discussing this a little bit, um, companion planting and trap cropping. These are a lot of terms that don't really have a clear definition, but how I usually teach it is intercropping. It's kind of the umbrella term. This is growing two or more crops in close proximity to promote beneficial interactions between them. And then companion planting is a little more specific. That refers to the establishment of two or more species in close proximities so that there's some cultural benefit, such as pest control or increased yield. And then trap cropping involves growing plants alongside a target crop that are more appealing to certain pests, thereby protecting that crop. Um, so last year, I actually put together a 20 minute webinar where I really deep dive into these concepts and I bring up some practical examples that have been done and tested before of different companion planting and trap, crop, trap cropping methods. And that can be found on our USU Extension YouTube channel. But I think ultimately there's three points you wanna ask yourself if you wanna consider intercropping. You wanna determine if the pest that you're trying to control is actually present, determine what specific cash crop you're trying to protect and what are some usual problems associated with it. And then you wanna ensure the timing of your trap crops growth and if that's gonna align with the damaging life stage of the pest you're trying to control. Okay, so the next one, kind of a big one that um, Wes talked a little bit about is soil borne diseases. So as you know, soil can be a reservoir for many plant diseases and plants are under regular attack by these soil borne organisms. If inoculum levels are high enough and environmental conditions become favorable for infection, susceptible plants will develop disease. Soil-borne pathogens are readily spread if infested soil or contaminated water moves into the fields or other planting areas. So some common soil-borne diseases that um, I see a lot or growers report to me include different species of Fusarium, Verticillium, Pythophthora, Pythium, Rhizoctonia, and a lot more. And sadly, once a plant is infected, they cannot be treated and they really should be removed. It's important to use cultural control practices to prevent um, the introduction of disease to improve the overall soil health. So one method that a lot of people always ask about me is solar soil, soil, uh, this is a tongue twister, soil solarization using plastic. And this can be an option um, in it because it can heat the soil at some specific depths, which can kill off um, different fungi. Um, it's not used on a wide scale in small farms because it requires giving up a significant amount of space the entire season because you would need like the heat of the summer to do this. And this method could also potentially be harmful to microorganisms in our soil. The California IPM program has some good literature where they have actually used soil solarization for small farms. And I can share that in the chat later. Um, another one that Wes actually just talked about was cover crops in the mustard family. Um, there's some literature from Michigan State University where they do this on a large scale because Plants in the mustard family have been shown to have biofumigation properties due to the high presence of glucosinates. And again, research on this is still relatively new, and it may not be practical for small farms because it does require the use of a lot of space. Um, homeowners and commercial producers can actually grow grafted plants that have greater resistance. So grafting combines a disease resistant rootstock with a scion, and that is chosen for the desired qualities of the fruit. So when I was an undergraduate at the University of Nebraska, we worked a lot with Estamino and Maxifort tomato varieties, 
which were which we use for disease resistant rooks rootstocks and we grafted on some heirloom varieties of tomatoes onto those um, finally, you can purchase some fungicide treated seeds. Usually it's thurum, which they treat the seeds with. And this can help give your plants a fighting chance, especially when they're brand new and germinating in the soil. So Wes just gave a whole awesome presentation on crop rotation. Um, so I won't deep dive into that, but essentially for plant diseases, including those soil borne diseases we just discussed here, five things you want to consider. So the first is you want to consider how long the pathogen you're trying to control can survive in the soil, which additional plant species, including weeds or cover crops, can it infect or survive on. Um, other ways that this disease can survive between susceptible crops, how long it can spread or be reintroduced into a field, and methods for managing other pathogen sources. So for crop rotation to control an insect pest, the insect must spend the period from the end of one crop to the beginning of the next stage with low, low mobility and must have a restrict restricted range of host plants. And sadly, not many insect problems that we have in Utah hit this pattern. So the next thing you can consider is cultivar selection. So these are plants with tolerance or resistance to arthropods or disease that can be bred for through selected traits or sometimes genetically engineered as seen with some agronomic crops like rice, corn, or wheat. Um, the term resistant means a plant with resistance has certain characteristics that make pathogens less likely to enter the plant or to reproduce on or in that plant. And then the term tolerant is a plant with tolerance can be, can still become infected with a pathogen, but the damage will be less severe than a susceptible plant. So this photo here um, was from a study in California where this field was known to have um, a specific strain of fusarium. So they were testing different cultivars of strawberries. And you can clearly see that this variety was really susceptible and did not do well. And then this variety of strawberries was tolerant. So as you guys are flipping through your seed catalogs or looking online, a lot of seeds will have codes or letters telling you if they are resistant or tolerant to um, specific diseases or problems. So if that's something you know you have on your site, that would be something good to consider. So the next and big one I think is water management. So most plant diseases are caused by fungi and bacteria that can spread via spores or by cells. The fungal spores and bacteria cells are not often released until they have been wet for a certain period. And once released, they may be carried by the wind or in raindrops or irrigation water. Splashing water droplets moves pathogens short distances, and the splash can carry the spores from the soil to the lower plant leaves. The lower plant leaves can move to the upper plant leaves and from one plant to another. And then the spores can also move longer distance if they're wind blown water droplets. So manage your water to also manage disease. So avoid overhead irrigation and sprinkler irrigation. Instead, opt for drip irrigation. Um, irrigate in the morning to allow your plant canopies to dry out during the heat of the day. And then of course, avoid standing water in your field as this is a good breeding ground for disease. So the next thing is trapping for pests. Um, for insects, you can use pheromone traps. And these work because insects communicate using chemical substances that they produce called pheromones. And pheromones of some vegetable pests have been synthesized and are available to purchase and allure for monitoring traps. So you can see this picture, this little rubber eraser looking thing is a pheromone. 
And pheromone traps are primarily used for moth species, including horn earworms, cutworms, armyworms, diamondback moths, cabbage loopers, and a lot more. And there's online sources where you can purchase sticky traps along with pheromone lures in small amounts. I've seen them run from $5 to $25. So here's an example of a Delta trap style. And then this is a trap from the Utah Department of Ag and Food. Um, this is to monitor for the Japanese beetle. So it's kind of not a sticky trap, but you can see the lure here and it captures the beetles for the monitoring. And then, of course, there's mechanical traps that you can use to physically catch vertebrates, like shown here. There are lethal and non-lethal options. And a good thing to remember, if you're managing rodents or other wildlife, you want to reference your local laws and regulations to determine what is legal in terms of management, removal, and relocation. Okay, so one of my favorite is physically excluding pests with row covers. So row covers are transparent or semi-transparent materials that are used to cover crops, typically vegetables for a variety of pur purposes. They act as a physical barrier to prevent the movement of pests such as insects, birds, mammals to the host plants and to form and this worm is a popular management in organic production because you're avoiding chemical applications. And a couple of years ago when I started this position, I did a lot of work with row covers for pest exclusion with farms across the state. And on our USU Extension channel, you can find a construction tutorial video. And then I did like a full on webinar diving deep into row covers and how you can use them. Um, a few common brands of spun-bound fabric include Agrabon and Remay. Um, there's different grades or thicknesses available, and the pricing is dependent on the grade of material you buy, you buy and the amount you purchase. So let's talk about some other physical exclusion. So obviously fences, right? When designed and set up correctly, fences will provide 100% exclusion. Fences limit access and movement of different vertebrae pests like deer, elks, dogs, cats, coyotes, raccoons, and even children. And the costs are variable and dependent on the material and the amount you buy. Um, you guys might be familiar with bagging. So you can bag your fruits. This is an excellent way to exclude various insect pests like our cherry flies, collie moth, twig borers, and much more season long. I found um, a pack of 100 of these bags for about $17 online. So different options available to you. Um, certain insects can be managed using food baits. Baits consist of a mixture of a substance to attract the insect, and sometimes you can put an insecticide in it to kill them. For example, earwigs, pill bugs, and spring kills can be baited using a thick oil substance and a smelly substance like soy sauce pictured here. Slugs and snails can be baited using iron phosphate or yeast products. And then grasshoppers can be baited using a wheat-laced carborol. Um, this past winter, I've been saving up a bunch of little plastic and metal containers that I'm gonna be using to make my own bait traps this season. So a lot of this stuff is just at-home products and you don't need to spend a lot of money on them. One of the last things I wanna talk about is biological control. So this is any activity of one species that reduces the adverse effect of another. In pest management, this usually refers to parasitites, pathogens, or predators on a pest population. Um, a few years ago, I had two of my colleagues put together two webinars where they go into depth of all the beneficial insects that we have in Utah, along with their identification and use. And these can be found on our USU Extension YouTube channel. And you can actually purchase beneficial insects from a variety of sources. So I listed some examples that I'm familiar with here. And a thing to note is, Releasing beneficials is often more conducive to enclosed spaces like greenhouses or high tunnels as beneficials tend to disperse after being released. 
However, you can always promote naturally occurring beneficials through habitat plantings on your farm, which Laura will talk about in the next presentation. And then of course, we have synthetic pesticides. So if you determine that a pesticide is needed for treatment, you wanna be aware that for insects and many diseases that treatments should be applied only during the time period when the most susceptible life stage of that pest is active. So in addition, if symptoms of feeding are found but no casual insect can be identified, a chemical spray is usually not recommended. So pesticides are usually grouped by mode of action, which means it's how that active ingredient in the pesticide will kill the targeted organism, which is usually designated by a group number. And it's always good to rotate among pesticides and different group numbers to reduce the likelihood of pest resistance. And along with synthetic pesticides, we have organic pesticides. So these are derived from natural sources um, and are minimally processed. These sources um, are usually from plants like neem oils, pyrethrums, um, rotenon, and ryania, or which is like a botanical insecticide, or they're from different minerals like boric acid and diatomaceous earth. Um, like I said, there's also or there's also microbial pesticides available as well. Um, if you're a certified organic farm, you might want to look for products that are OMRI listed, which is an acronym for the Organic Materials Review Institute. So this is a nonprofit organization that reviews fertilizers, pesticides, etc., for certified organic production and processing. So I'm kind of out of time, and that was a lot of information, but the number one resource that you guys can use is this website right here. I recommend bookmarking it to your phone. It's extension.usu.edu slash s. And here you can find a link to our diagnostic services. So if you have an insect pest sample or a photo of a pest, you can send this to our Utah Plant Diagnostic Lab to have it identified. You can also get a lot more information on the topics that I talked about through our guidebooks available. We have different literature fact sheets available. And then what I think is really helpful is we have different video tutorials where we're actually on site showing you a lot of these different pest management techniques. So with that being said, I'll open it up to, I think we probably have time for like one question, but I will be available in the q a to answer anything awesome thank you so much nick um okay great question here would using chickens as pest control be considered mechanical or biological definitely biological so that's a predator yeah awesome and then what is the best way to get rid of squash bugs before the planting season yeah that's a big question i will send a link with a video where i explain go in depth of all that and the timing Awesome. And I think we have um, time to address this one. I kind of tackled it in the questions, but um, talk, talk a little bit about powdery mildew and control there. Yeah. So powdery mildew is best managed very early in the season, no matter what crop it is. Be out monitoring, looking for those tiny little white powder spots early on and applying a fungicide. So different sulfur products are a good organic option. Um, I forget the active ingredient, but Serenade is a brand name that I've used for powdery mildew. And just making sure that you don't apply in the heat of the day to burn your plants okay. is some good tip.